want you to lift those hands up and let's give glory to where it really belongs. Father, we give you honor tonight. We give you glory tonight. This is your time. This, these hearts are your hearts. Father, write in them exactly what you want to write. Give me your utterance to speak those things that you're going to put into every heart that's here. And thank you for bringing those things to pass through every life that is here. We count you faithful that it's done, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 You want to turn your Bibles with me to James chapter 1. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Yeah, I was waiting for it to go again. James chapter 1. Now tonight, the, I always have to come up with a title, so here's the title. God Proves. God Proves. It, it, you know, I, I'm not that old, but I've been around long enough to hear an awful lot of really, really bad things come out of a really large amount of Christians' mouths. And one of the things that uh, is very, very tender to me is my relationship with my father, God. And I was adopted. So the father that raised me was very, very precious to me. And uh, because of some things that happened with my natural mother and, and in uh, premature birth and a bunch of sickness of that, I was not very strong, very big, very strong when I was young with that. So, I mean, I, I had a very difficult time just existing, surviving, amen, especially in school, amen, and I would do anything at all to avoid a fight because I didn't want to get hurt, okay? But one of the things that would get me in a fight in a heartbeat was you talking bad about my daddy. That brought something out of me. And I'd be all over you. Amen. Well, I guess I kind of carried over to when I got born again when I was seven. And when I began to develop that relationship with my Heavenly Father, because I'd, all I had was my Heavenly Father. My parents, I told my parents I'd gotten born again, and they would not let me go to church. They weren't Christians. Later on, they did help ministry. They got saved and all that. But at that time, they didn't want me to have a Bible. They didn't want me to go to church. They kept me from church. You know, they, they thought all kinds of things. I joined a cult or, you know, all kinds of really wild things. But I had, the, I had God. Jesus was in me. I had that relationship. And even though I was seven years old, I knew I could talk to my father. And I did. Every morning when I got up and every, every night before I went to bed, at least during that time, I talked to my father. And that relationship became very close. And then I began to finally sneak away to church when I was 15 and a half and got a driver's license. You know, I'm going to go over here to study, but I kind of made a path over to the Bible study, you know, and whatever. And I began to get around believers. And all of a sudden, I started hearing things about my father. And I kept thinking, how could you say that? And, you know, my first impression started to be, Maybe I have a different God. Really. Because the God that I'd experienced for seven, and a, seven years, seven and a half years, eight years, by myself pretty much, was not the person that they were describing. And I started hearing things like, well, you know, Sister So-and-so has cancer because God's wanting to teach her something. And I didn't know a lot of scripture then. In fact, I was just getting a Bible, <laughs> just starting to read a Bible. But something on the inside of me, just when I'd hear those things, something on the inside would say, that can't be right. Because that's not my daddy. And when I did start to read some scriptures, you know, that kind of on the surface looked like they were saying that God was putting something bad on someone or God was where that. Something inside said, you're not reading that right because that can't be saying what you think it's saying because that's not my daddy. Right. That's right. Amen. 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 Look at James. James chapter 1. We'll start reading verse 12. It's blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, 
he shall receive the crown of life which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. God is not the tempter. God is not the tester. God is not the trier. He's the prover. I'll show you what that means in just a second. But right here, he's talking about you're going to be blessed if you come through temptation. In other words, the temptation doesn't take you down. Or the temptation doesn't take you off course. Hallelujah. Well, if God's saying you're blessed if the temptation doesn't work, then he's saying you're blessed if God fails. Well, if he's the tempter. See, it didn't make any sense to me. You know, thank God for the Holy Ghost. Amen. Sometimes you begin to know something before you know it. Amen. Well, notice what he said. If you endure temptation. Well, temptation's not coming from God. What's coming from God is the ability to, to endure and get through and be victorious over the temptation. You know, let's identify the characters here. Look at the next verse. Let no man say. Now, I don't know if you know, realize it or not, but that's a commandment. You know what a commandment is? I remember I was in a room one time. That Dad was dealing with some of his children. He had a little three-year-old three girl. And somebody had said something. The brother was saying that he was learning the, the, the Ten Commandments in his, his, his class over. So the father looked to the little three-year-old and said, you know, honey, do you, do you know what a commandment is? And she, without, without hesitation, she just said, yeah, that means you got to do it. And I thought, what wisdom from a three-year-old? There, a commandment is not an option. It's a you got to do it. You know, one of my favorite parenting jewels to pass on to a parent is it's very biblical to answer your child when you tell them not to do something and they go, why? It's very biblical to say, because I said so, <laughs> period. As in, you don't need any explanation other than do what? I said. You know how happy Christians would be if they just did what God said to do? Amen. Instead of trying to figure out some kind of way of explaining how they can get out of doing what it is that God wants them to do? Just do it. Just get it over with. Amen? Amen. So this is a command. Amen. Let no man say, when he is tempted, I'm tempted of God. Now, you know, I struggled through school because of sicknesses and ailments, whatever, but we also had a lot of problems during the time when I was going to elementary school. We had a lot of problems. We had riots actually going on. There was a lot of months that I literally didn't sit in the classroom. I was running from riots with all the other people, hiding. <laughs> Amen. And so there was a big period of time when I should have learned things like grammar, <laughs> spelling, To this day, I know it was only the Lord that I, got, that I made it through college and high school. Amen. Thank God he understands algebra and calculus and, and all that other stuff. Amen. And, you know, one of the greatest inventions in the world, I thought, was spell check. Oh, yeah. And then I found out spell check will change your word and give you a word you didn't intend to put there. And it, you don't, it doesn't do that until you print it out. And then it's too late to change it. You know, or you send the email and you find out the person sent, you know that you put this word in there, well, that's not the word I type. And you find out spell check changed it on you. Amen. But he, it's, it's, but you know, I am smart enough to understand, and I did but when I first began to read this as a child, don't even think about saying with your mouth that if something bad's happening in your life, that it's God doing it. Amen. Now, if he says don't say it, let's take a little further. Don't even think that way. Don't even assume that way. In fact, just assume it's never God if something bad is going on. You know, the Bible talks about, thank God, that the Lord is our present help 
in time and trouble, which means he's always clocked in as the helper. Not to help you into trouble, to help you out of trouble. You know, I hear people complain, about, you know, they're in the most dire situation and they're talking bad about God and I'm thinking, you know, you're not going to get real far talking bad about the only person who can actually get you out of this situation. You know, and if it's his will for you to be sick now, but it's his will for you to be healed here, then God must be schizophrenic. Maybe we need to be praying for God. Maybe it's God that's needing some help and some healing. The last time I checked, he said, I am the Lord. You're never going to figure out how I am when, I wake up in the, when you wake up in the morning. Oh, no, wait a minute. I'm sorry. That's the Greek gods. That's all those other gods. No, our God is the same. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he's on my side, he's not there to test me or tempt me or try me yesterday. He's not there to tempt, try, or test me today. And if I'm not supposed to say yesterday that he's my tempter, then it ain't going to say it today, and I'm definitely not going to say it tomorrow. There's never going to be a time because he doesn't change. You know, I'm the Lord God that healeth thee, except on Thursday, which is test day. Amen. Well, but the Bible says that God tested people. Well, let's look what it really says. Let no man say when he's tempted, verse 13 again, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. Neither tempteth he any man. How plain can you be? I guess you have to have one of those messed up, devil-inspired, modern translations to say it a different way. I, you know, I read somewhere the other day about God's mercy being new every morning. Is that in your Bible too? So every morning means every morning. So every morning God's got mercy. Wow. That might, that, you know what? That means I might be able to make it. If there's mercy available every morning. But every man is tempted. Uh-oh, let's, let's find out where blame goes. Every man is tempted when he's drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. Sin is getting away from the will of God, the way of God, the purpose of God, into some other will, some other way, some other purpose, and eventually leads to death, and death means separation. So the point of, of temptation or testing or trying is to get you to get off, to sin, to miss it, and eventually take you to a place of death, meaning you're separated from God or his blessing. So God is going to do something to separate you from himself? No. So why do Christians make all these crazy statements? I guess they've gotten help. Amen. But also, see, it makes it really easy to put the blame on God. That way you don't have to take the blame yourself. Like, maybe I'm in this situation because... I put myself in this situation. You know, I, I look at it this way. This is clearly saying that God's not the one that's hindering you from walking in his will, walking in his purpose, and walking in his blessing. There's somebody else trying to get you off. Well, that wouldn't be God. That would be the devil. Let's, let's read on. Uh, Do not err, my brethren. Every good gift, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness... No variableness. Ain't that, ah, oh, it's so wonderful to know that we have a God that doesn't change at all. There's no variableness. Nor shadow of turning. There's a lot of shadows being preached. Well, yeah, God is good, but... 
And then there's the occasion when. Now those are shadows. And God doesn't have any shadows of turning. It's always the same. Always the same. So, you know, don't even think about blaming God. That, that's the number one thing. God's never going to do something to get you out of his will or his blessing. Now, think about that. Think of a, think of a father who's got, a, you know, a little child. You know, and across the room, there's the mother. And, and the child's at that point where it can just, it's starting to learn how to walk. And the father will say, okay, now you see mama? Now walk to mama. And the child starts to walk, right? Give, give him a good start. The child starts, you know, teetering and, you know, toddling across the room. And then the father gets up and starts throwing cushions and starts throwing uh, blankets, starts throwing all kinds of things in front of the child to try to trip him up and get him off path. You think there's something wrong with that father. Well, the way some people preach God, that's what it sounds like. Why would the person who's telling you to go from point A to point B be the one to get up and get between you and point B and try to hinder you from getting there? Amen. No, what I read is he, he's not only going to tell you to get up and go from point A to point B, but then he's going to get up and get in front of you and make the way. Amen. Not only lead the way, but plow the road. In other words, go ahead of you and start getting things out of the way. Start setting things up for you to get through booby traps and landmines and all these other things and things the enemy and snares the, that, that the enemy has prepared for you. Jesus is going to go ahead of us, John 10 says, not, and not only lead us, but he's going to plow the way. And he's going to give us the way through and helping us get through, not hindering us. So God's not the tester. God's not the tempter. And don't even think about opening up your mouth and saying it. Honey, you know what? If you don't know what to say, tongue it. <laughs> Learned that one a long time ago. If you, if you don't know how to pray, you don't know what to say in a situation, just because you can't get it wrong. And I guarantee you, not one syllable of tongues is going to be blaming God for the situation. You think? <laughs> Amen. Look at Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1. And it came to pass as after these things that God did, I'm reading King James, did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains, which I will tell thee. Now here's a little side note about being led by God. If you're expecting God to tell you every detail of the journey before you start the journey, you're missing the point. He's going to say, go. And you're going to go, go where? And he's going to say, yes. He's going to but which way? And God's going to go, uh-huh. In other words, what he's saying is, move. As soon as you move, you're going to get the next step. And, the ne and then you move, you get the next step. Then you move, you get the next step. Because then you're constantly being led. If he gave you the whole thing, one of the things you might do is go, well, wait a minute, I don't think I like point 13. Boy, point 17 don't look too good either. So he just goes, do this. Do you know how many Christians 40, 50 years later are still waiting Actually, they're not waiting. It's God waiting on them. They're not waiting on God. God's waiting on them just to do the first step. Amen. Well, when is all this going to happen in my life, God? And God's still going back to take this step. I, I was just recently overseas and dealing with literally brand new believers. As in, they've never known anybody in their life that was a Christian. And I was talking with this one this one gentleman, we ended up getting into it in the class, but he was talking about, you know, I've been praying and praying and praying for God to help me in my finances and, our, and our, paying our bills and da 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 you know, you know, what do I do, Brother Ron? And I said, well, you know, there's really one thing you can do just to start. And he goes, he says, well, you know, 
What are all the things that God... Said, well, you know what? Before we get into all the things, there's one thing you can do just to start, and that's going to be a big help toward getting God involved in your finances. He goes, well, what is it? Tithe. And then he's like, okay, and then what do I... I said, no, no, you're... Tithe. Well, then how do I handle this? How do I believe God? Tithe. See, I don't hear back from you, oh, okay, I'm going to start tithing. And until I hear that from you, I'm not going to tell you anything else. Because the other stuff isn't going to be doing anything if you're not tithing. Your brother just got into that. Notice that God said in there, prove me. But see, they needed to tithe first. Then, God, then it would prove God. The word prove is a better translation of the word translated tempt, where it says he, he did tempt Abraham. The actual word there should be translated prove. See, the devil tests, tempts, tries to get you out of God's will and prevent the blessing from coming, okay? God proves you to get something to manifest, to get something to happen, literally, so that he himself can show up and manifest. And that's the difference between the two. God was not doing this to Abraham as a test. Well, let's see if he'll do it. Because God already knew what he would do. Doesn't God already know everything? He knows what, he knows the past, he knows the present, he knows the future. So he wasn't testing him to see he, if he would do it. He, he already knew he was going to do it. He was testing him to prove him. Now, what's the difference? The word prove literally means to bring into existence. It means to manifest. It means literally to make reality. How many of you would like some promises of God to be proved in your life? Okay. Well, there's this in between step <laughs> between God making the promise and providing and it manifesting. There's an in between step. That step has nothing to do with God, it has everything to do with you. And that's why the devil's trying to test, tempt, and try you to get you not to do your part. Therefore, God can't manifest it. How many of you like the fact that Jesus came? Did you know that Abraham, if Abraham hadn't done this, God would not have legally been able to send Jesus here and offer him as a sacrifice? Boy, you just got really, really quiet on me. God got into a covenant with Abraham. What's interesting is God didn't come to Abraham and say, hey, let's cut a covenant. He came to Abraham and started making promises. And at some point, hearing all these promises of, you know, I'll do this, I'll do that for you, I'll do this for you, I'll bless your kid, I'll bless your grandkid, I'll bless your great grandkids. And somewhere in the, talking about all these blessings and promises, Abraham goes, whoa, 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 time out, time out, time out, time out. I'm hearing all these promises, all these wonderful things you want to do, God. How do I know you're going to do it? And the Bible says, because God couldn't find anybody stronger to swear by, he swore on himself and made the promise. And he said, I'll keep the promises. It's Abraham that was saying to God, if you really are saying you're going to do this, then make a commitment. Cut a covenant and swear to it. So who invited who into a covenant? It wasn't God inviting Abraham. See, it was Abraham, a man on the earth, who was giving God authority here on the earth. 
He was giving God place. Well, see, that's what God wanted him to do. But it had to be Abraham initiating it. So they cut the covenant. Now God's obligated in a covenant with man on the earth. Well, he said, all right, I'm going to bless all the nations on the earth through you. So he started asking Abraham to do something. He did it. And then Abraham would ask God to do something. God would do it. Amen. And it just kept going back and forth. And it got to the point that there wasn't anything God had asked Abraham to do, which, by the way, he did, except offer his own son. So he, he asked him, you know, offer your son to me on an altar. has a sacrifice, right? And he's in covenant with man on the earth. Abraham did it. The minute Abraham did it on earth in covenant, God is now legally obligated to send his only son in the flesh on the earth and be offered as a sacrifice in covenant. What do you mean God was legally obligated? Yeah. I believe the word they use in the New Testament is he was behooved. It means to be legally obligated. That something happens that, that you get responsible is a really weird word in the Hebrew. It, you get responsible. In other words, suddenly you get made responsible and you're obligated legally. Now, if he had not sent Jesus, his only son, in the flesh on the earth and then offered him as a sacrifice, God would have been breaking the covenant. You know he wasn't going to do that. So he wasn't getting Abraham to do this, to test him, to try him, to get him off. Or, you know, to see if he's going to do it. He was doing it to get him to do something in covenant so that he could do something. Like, I want to move. I've promised I was going to move. This is what I said I'm going to do, but I need the authority to do it. Abraham, offer your son. When he did, now God not only was obligated that he had to do it, he was legally able now to do it. So when God comes to you and deals with you about something, it's not to, he doesn't do things to try to get you off. He does things to try to get across to you the understanding of a do. The purpose of the, one of the purposes of the Holy Ghost and the Word, and that's why we need to keep a constant relationship with the Word every day, with the Holy Ghost every day, is we begin to get just simple, and it's not always a burning bush, a lot of times it's a still small voice. Everything else is shouting and screaming. Amen? Telling you what to do. And all of a sudden this little tiny still small voice tells you the simplest. It's, in fact, a lot of times it's so simple you think that can't be God. Yeah. Or that can't be all I have to do. Amen. And then you do that one little do. And all of a sudden God boom, moves. Why was he able to suddenly move? Because you did the do that you suddenly got understanding of. In other words, your do allowed God to prove, manifest, bring into existence, bring into reality. See, in one way, our relationship with God is just a series of, just a series of listening and doing, listening and doing, listening and doing, listening and doing, listening and doing. A long time ago, I was doing an awful lot of traveling overseas, and I, and I had a lot of things starting to happen that I almost think I shouldn't have been involved in, but, it, you know, I was already in my lap. I was trying to turn it to things over other people. I was just getting swamped, I guess is the right way. And I was still maintaining my personal time with God with that, but, boy, it was so crowded, just like, you know, Everybody was telling me, you got to have a daytimer. or whatever. So I was trying to fill out like three daytimers, you know, one for me personally, one for the ministry, you know, and I don't have a daytimer anymore. Amen. <laughs> for me, it doesn't work. And all of a sudden, God stopped me one time and just said, Ron, put all that stuff away. I said, but Lord, you know, I got to do this, and I can't miss this, and I can't let that go, and I got I to spend time. He says, yeah, I know that. I said, but you need to, you need to simplify things. He said, you're not going to remember all this stuff anyway. I remember it all. I'll let you know what it is. So I figured, okay, I'll let him be my daytimer. 
And he said, here's what you need to think about. Go to bed and go to sleep right now. Well, I said, Lord, okay, do you want me to read something like that? No. Don't read anything. Okay, well, Lord, then I'll pray. He said, no, don't pray. Go to bed. Go to sleep. But Lord, I got all this stuff. He goes, I know. And here's what you're going to do about it. Slowly, I started to get the point that he was trying to tell me. I'm going to tell you what you do, and that'll let me do what I'm going to do, which is take care of all this stuff that you can't take care of. And he said, get, go to bed, get a good night's sleep, and when you wake up in the morning, all you got to do is remember three words. Read, pray, do. Read your Bible. Pray, means pray in tongues, worship God, spend time with the Lord. Then do what you read and do what you heard in prayer. He said, well, then, then what, Lord? Well, then go to sleep again. <laughs> Just go to bed. But, Lord, I, I, I don't have an answer for this yet. I don't have any. I know you don't. Go to bed. When you, whenever you wake, when you wake up, rest it, read, pray, do. Then what? Go to sleep. Now, I know walking with God in one way is a lot more complicated than that, but in another way, it's not. It's that simple. The simpler you make your side, I just got to read and pray until I get understanding of the do. And then do the do. What about tomorrow's do? How about just worry about this morning's do? Let alone tomorrow. Amen? And it's amazing what you get done. Because you stop doing everything, and God is now able to do stuff, because you're doing what He says to do gives Him authority to do what He does. And that proves. Now, just to give you an understanding, that word that was translated tempt in, in Genesis 22, it's the, it's the Hebrew word nasah. It also means to cause to manifest. It means to prove, but it means to cause to manifest. Now, the word you're thinking of when most people think about tempting and testing and, and trying on it, that over in Matthew chapter 22, Jesus was talking about, you know, he was teaching with a group of people in the temple area, and the doctors and scribes came to test him, to, to tempt him and to test him. And they said, tell us therefore why, uh, Matthew 22, verse 17 and 18. Tell us therefore what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Jesus perceived their wickedness. Notice that? Jesus perceived their wickedness. They were trying to test him. And he said, that's wicked. Amen. Remember, God can't be tempted with evil, neither can he tempt with evil. That would mean wickedness too. The word evil there means Divided. So God isn't going to talk to you and lead you one way this minute and then try to talk you into being led another way the next minute. It's going to be the same. It's going to be consistent. It's going to be constant. In fact, one of the ways you know you're hearing from God about something is every time you talk to God, he keeps saying the same thing. He keeps saying the same thing and brings up the same thing and talks about the same thing. You get to the point of, I think there's a pattern forming here. Like maybe this is something God wants me to do. You know, when you only hear it once, and you never hear it again, you never hear God talk about it ever again, I'd put that one on the shelf. Because if it's God, it's going to be a continuing witness. Every time he comes to you, he's not going to divert. I remember one year, Every single time I got out of prayer, speaking my Bible in prayer, God would talk about a couple things, and he would say, oh, and by the way, don't forget, you need to start ministering to people, Chinese people. That was all he said. Every single time I prayed for a whole year. And then all of a sudden, one day, I got an invitation to Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, and God did a bunch of miracles to get me there. Literally, the airline gave me a free ticket, round-trip ticket. And they called me. They go, you know, are you doing any traveling overseas? We notice you do a lot of traveling overseas. You don't by chance go to Asia, do you? And, well, I'm, I, why? Why are you asking me? Well, we're opening up a new route to Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. 
And for the first two months, if we can prove enough business, they're going to give us permanent routes. So if, you, if you'd be willing to fly during those two months, we'll give you a free round-trip ticket. Now, I had just gotten an invitation from a man in Kuala Lumpur asking me if I'd come. And I'd emailed him back and said, I'll pray about it. And I got the phone call about 10 minutes later. So I email, I'm starting to email him back. And I get it, you know, one of those members, my mom used to go, you've got mail, you know. <laughs> and it opened, and I went, oh, so I opened it up, and it was him. Before I even finished writing the, le- the email to him, he emailed back and said, that's great that you're coming. Can you come this month and leave this month? That's the two months that the airline were offering me a ticket. Oh, my goodness. I had to do a lot of praying about that one. <laughs> so I go there, and I, I, I go there, and all I'm really supposed to do is spend time with this gentleman. And when I land there, I find out he's arranged like 15 Bible studies. And that turned into a bunch of church meetings. And I was doing like 11 churches on first Sunday, and I did, I think, 12 churches the second Sunday, and a whole bunch of meetings in between. And by the time we were done, we had over 2,000 people saved, but we had well over 6,000 people gotten filled with the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues for the first time. I'm coming back from the last church on the last Sunday, going back to his house because we gotta, I got to catch a 2 a.m. flight out. And while we're driving back, the Lord said, by the way, did you happen to notice the people you've been ministering to the last 10 days? And, went, and I'm, looking, I'm looking, you know, in my mind at all the faces and everything. He said, did you notice they're all Chinese? It suddenly dawned on me. I would ministered to all these people who, within the, about a year before, had all migrated from China into Malaysia. And a lot of them were born again, but they'd never heard of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. So God sent me over there to get them all filled with the Holy Ghost, teach them about the Holy Spirit. And the Lord said, I told you you were going to minister, you needed to start ministering to Chinese people. <laughs> so God, God will keep telling you. But the word there that's used in that verse where it says, uh, they came up to him and said, you know, should should we pay tribute to Pilate? And notice what Jesus said. Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? That's a complete different word. That's perazo, and it means to scrutinize. It means to provoke, to push. But it also means to entice, like to draw off. So let's get it real clear. The devil tempts, tries, and tests. Why? To get you off. What does God do? In the midst of a situation, God gives you a do. I tell you what, don't be surprised at the do. I've had the most simple, ridiculous, almost like, well, that ain't going to do nothing. Well, it's, you know, the act isn't doing anything, but the act performed in faith and obedience because God said to do it enables God and then he proves his word and gets me not only through the temptation but victorious and blessed coming out the other side. Look with me real quickly. Let's see. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Yeah, we'll look at there real quick. Get ready to close up on that. You getting something tonight? This might end up being a book. I tell you what. Just, just get, I hate people talking bad about my daddy. And especially when, you, when it's one of his own kids and you're in all this trouble and he's up there going, I know how to get you out of this. I can help you here. And, and, and they're sitting there blaming him. Why are you doing this to me, God? Or the worst one. See, a lot of people think directly blaming God. God, why are you doing this to me? You put this cancer on me. To me, the worst one is the sly, well, now God didn't do this to me, but God's allowing it. If he's allowing it, that means he, can, he has the ability to not allow it, so therefore he's doing it. They're both wrong. But see, I think that second one's worse, because that means God's kind of tricky and devious, and he isn't straightforward. 
One of the reasons people don't like talking to God very much is because he always speaks the truth. Even if it ain't something you want to hear at that moment. Amen. Did you find 1 Corinthians chapter 10? Look at verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. If you think you're the only one going through it, nobody's ever gone through it before, yeah, right. <laughs> if nothing else, Jesus has been through it. He's been tempted in every way a person could be tempted. But notice, there's no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful. I love the way Paul just drops that right in there. Let's separate this right from the beginning. Temptation's coming, but it ain't God, because he's faithful. Now notice, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able? But will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. So let's get it straight. The devil tempts, tests, and tries, and in the middle of all of that, if you're not able to handle it, God's going to get you his ability. That's called grace. See, grace is God's ability. Well, maybe you can't handle it, but God can handle it. And if you've got God's ability working, you can not only handle it and bear it, but you can come through it victorious and turn the thing around. Amen? So, when bad things are happening, God's not the one causing it nor allowing it, he's the one in the middle of it going, over here. Got a way of escape. Come over here. What's the way of escape? A do. Satan is tempting, testing, enticing, seducing, provoking to sin. Amen. He's trying to get you to miss God's plan, God's will, and God's blessing. That's what he's trying to do with it. God gives dues to help you stand through all the devil's storms of temptation. And then to come out of it with a God manifestation. Now see, what happens is, God, in the middle of the storm, God invites you or invokes you. Now the difference between invoking and provoking is provoking is pushing, driving. Like goats. Goats are driven. Smack them, hit them, drive them. God invokes, Amen. invites, leads, gets ahead and says, come on, draw, draws, come on, this way, this way, this way. Takes you out of the storm. Notice he's right there in the middle of it with you. And he begins to present to you a way of escape, a door. And what that door is, it's a do. Now, when you hear the do or you get understanding of a do, first of all, it gives you faith, right? Because hearing God's word, hearing God's will gives you faith, right? But also, when you understand a do, when you understand something to obey, at that moment, you have an that you have a knowledge of an opportunity to obey something, grace is available right there. Amen. But it's not activated until you, by faith, start to step into that obedience, then His grace takes over, and you're not only able to bear it, but you're able to come through it. Amen. So who's the tempter? The devil. Who's the one who provides the way of escape and proves? It's God. And God is literally trying to get us to do things so that He can do things. Pete Edmonds taught a sermon here one time about giving glory to God. Remember that? Romans 4, some of you remember that? And some people teach that, you know, he stayed strong in faith, giving glory to God meant that he, he kept praising the Lord. And what Pete taught, and it's so good, that no, it was his stand of faith continuously obeying God that got to the point where God was able to manifest it, Isaac's born, and that manifestation of the promise gave glory to God. So when you obey God and God's able to prove, manifest something through you, that gives glory to God. So God's not out trying to tear you down and stop you and prevent things. He's trying to invite you and invoke you, amen, into do, doing something, obeying, 
Thank God Abraham obeyed because we got Jesus. You obey God and do something that seems silly and stupid and whatever, but you just want it by faith. You just step out and obey it. And the next thing you know, it opens up a door and causes three or four people to come to the Lord. Or somebody to get healed. Or somebody to get delivered. That's what it's all about. Now look, we'll close with this. Genesis 22. I know I'm right at 9 o'clock. I know. God does not tempt, test, or try. He proves. He manifests. But we've got to give him place. We've got to give him authority. Once we do that, he can move. You can almost say it this way. God's able to perform through our performance of obedience. Amen. Amen. I need God involved in my finances. Tithe. No wonder it says, you know, if any sick among you, let him pray. Boy, that lead balloon's like a big lead balloon. Oh, wait, God won't just automatically have healing pouring out? No, he actually already has provided healing through Jesus. It's right there at the door. In fact, it's inside of you. What's going to release it? Getting an understanding of a do and just doing it. Sometimes the do is just praise them. Actually, to me, the hardest do is when God says, now I don't want you to do anything in this situation. Amen. Nothing? Nothing. Just don't do nothing. That's the hardest do for me because I want to help. But you know that not doing anything, just being still and knowing he's God, that's a do. Isn't that a do? And it's obeying God if, it's, if he tells you to do it. There are situations where God's given me something to do and I've done it or interact or like that, and there's times when God said, do nothing. And if I did it, did nothing, because he said so, he moved. Genesis 22, verse 12. And he said, you know, Abraham's got the boy, the fire, everything's getting ready to go, raises the knife, getting ready to come down. And the angel of the Lord says, whoa, stop. <laughs> okay? Now, you come to find out the angel of the Lord there is actually probably talk, he's talking about Jesus. And notice what he says to him. He said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. Now, listen to this statement. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Now, remember, God knows everything. So there's two no's here. There's the, he, he knew all along Abraham was, what Abraham was going to do, but he's saying, because you actually did it, God's saying, now I have a different no. See, there's God knowing, and then there's God knowing because he's experienced knowledge in your obedience. That knowing gives him authority. It's like, yeah, I know you love me, but I would really like to know it. Well, I, I know you believe I'm your source, but now I'd like to know it. I don't know why we keep coming back to that, but you can, you know, I was standing in a church one time, and everybody's got their hands up, and we, everybody was shouting, Jesus is Lord. Jesus, you're Lord. You're my Lord. You are my Lord. There is no other Lord. Jesus, you're my Lord. There is no other. You're my only God. You're my only one. I bow only to you. Everybody's screaming that out and praising God. Like their hands up at that. And the Lord said, yeah. And I want you to watch how many of them prove it by taking one of those hands down and pulling out their wallet and tithing. And I'm standing at the back of the church. And we went right from that to the offering, the tithes and offering. And a bunch of people sat on their wallet. And a whole bunch of other people took them out. And the Lord said, yep, they say I'm Lord, but they never prove it. And, be, and think about it. If they don't prove it with obedience, then he can't prove 
He's their source. So it's not that God won't. He can't. How many of you know God's provided salvation for every person? But he can't make it reality until every individual person obeys and believes and confesses. Once they obey that, now God's got authority to make what he did reality. Thank you, Father.